Well, I've always loved history, and I enjoy reading both historical fact and historical fiction. I love fitting a fictitious story into a real historical framework. I also enjoy a good whodunit in any setting. I've got a questioning mind, and I love trying to solve mysteries and puzzles of various kinds. I used to enjoy investigating frauds. The investigation into a mystery ensures the story has a beginning, a middle and an end. Some writers tend to ramble. I'm sure I would if I didn't have a framework to stick to. Of course, the other thing is setting a murder mystery in the past means you don't get too immersed in the forensics, the police procedures and databases. You get down to basic detective work. In 1713, my hero Billy Rees comes home from the war to the Rhondda Valley in Wales. He finds his father has lost all their money and finally loses the farm. He ends in debtor's prison. So Billy and his sister Bethan conspire to rob their creditors and pay them off with their own money. Their cousin Megan helps them at times. One of their victims finds who they are and asks for their help in recovering some missing letters. And that leads on to investigating her husband's death. Now, her relationship with Billy fluctuates dramatically throughout the story. Then the Jacobite rebellion breaks out, throwing all their plans up into the air. It involves Billy in undercover operations in Lancashire and in Scotland. Well, in this one, Billy and Bethan set out to find her missing husband. And the trail leads to London, to West Wales, and then to The Hague. Someone they're fond of is murdered, and they try to investigate it. Then on the way, they discover a Jacobite plot and try to capture a spy. And they carry out a scam to defraud one of their father's biggest creditors and pay off the debts. All along, Billy's relationship with the troublesome Helen and with his cousin Megan, well, they take many turns, I just say. They see various sides of the slave trade, too. And Billy and Bethan disagree about robbing a slave owner. In the end, they discover the meaning of the words, the king's justice. No, there's going to be at least one more. This one's going to be called Stallion Man. In that, Billy goes undercover again to thwart another Jacobite plot and to investigate another good friend's murder. Billy uses the cover of being the groom of a stallion visiting mares in several Jacobite-infested places in Pembrokeshire. And once again, for all his devious skills, he needs the help of Bethan and Megan and some of his other old friends, even the beautiful but troublesome Helen. But they're all in great danger, and so is the country, even when they think it's all over. Well, I did that period for my A-levels for a start, <laughs> that's a long time ago, but it's rather neglected, I feel, in fiction, unlike the Tudor period. I also wanted to correct a rather romantic view some people have of the Jacobites, and I want to stick up for the Hanoverians, who are often made to seem like the oppressors, wrongly in my opinion. It's worth remembering too that although the Jacobites failed in the end, it wasn't the non-starter that it's easy to believe. It's a bit like the way we don't take much notice sometimes these days when we hear of a terrorist plot being foiled. We tend to think it wasn't a real threat to us all along, but perhaps it was. I am English, but I've lived in various parts of Wales, including Cardiff, and I love the Principality and its people. I think it has a special identity. It's an ideal setting for any novel. It's also generally neglected by English writers. Personally, I can identify with the old motto of the town of Monmouth, Utrique Fidelis. It means loyal to both. For me, that means being loyal to both Wales and to Britain. It's also worth reminding people, of course, that the Jacobites weren't just confined to Scotland, as many people think. They, there were plenty of them in Wales, as well as many parts of England. Yes, it is. My Christian faith is important to me. But in any case, it was important in the 18th century. The novel needs to reflect the life of the time. 
I also wanted to correct the impression many people have that in the past all religious people were either fools or hypocrites. I wanted to show that many people had to struggle with their faith. There's a conflict between their religious beliefs and the very real pressures of life. And that's true now as it was then. Currently, there's Bernard Cornwell. He makes history real and exciting. And he weaves in his fictitious plots and characters into historical settings. Then there's Philippa Gregory. She so shows history from a woman's perspective. She makes women important players in the story, not just victims or scenery. And I try to do the same. Then there's Susanna Gregory. She writes some fascinating murder mysteries in historical settings. The first historical novelist I encountered was Ellis Peters. Her brother Cadbar's stories showed that you could be scientific in your approach, even in the Middle Ages. Then there was Peter Tremaine. He created the Sister Fidelma stories. She was a strong female detective with a scientific mind in Ireland, in what we wrongly consider the Dark Ages. It challenged a lot of my ideas. Well, I'm working on a story set in Britain before, during, and immediately after the Roman invasion. Some of the characters will favour becoming part of the Roman Empire, whilst others will be appalled at the thought. It's going to be a bit like Brexit in reverse. I also want to write a detective story set in the Stone Age, the time Britain first became inhabited, at the end of the Ice Age. Could say they were the first immigrants. Well, we have some things in common. A love of Wales and of Britain. A love of horses. We both have an inquiring mind. Apart from those things, I have most of his faults, but uh, few of his virtues. Well, I write non-fiction and also modern detective fiction in my own name. And people say you need to keep your different genres separate. And some people say that a pseudonym makes it safer for you to be controversial. I wouldn't know, but perhaps I'll find out. I'd also like to say that apart from my actual identity, all that I say about myself is true. Geoffrey Monmouth is a pseudonym, not a fictitious character. 